I think it's about time for me to update my bio. <laughs> um, thank you guys for joining. I uh, wasn't sure how big of a crowd we were going to have today, um, but I, I think what we're going to end up doing is making this as practical as possible for everybody. Uh, I do have slides. The slides are essentially progressions. The progressions are somewhat linear, um, but can be done concurrently. Um, what I'll ask when we get into the more the implement stages of the practical, um, I'll just have a handful of people, maybe a couple people, just come up and I'll demonstrate Q and then let other people come in and, and get a feel for it, just because we're not going to have enough room um, and or enough equipment with the bodies we have in here today. Um, with that being said, I'm not a gimmick gadget type of practitioner. Uh, to me, everything is progression based, based on competency. And competency for you may be different for me and different for anybody else in this room. But there's, there's certain things that I look to when I'm doing any of my trunk training work, and that's ultimately the integrity of the lumbopelvic complex. When I start to see that fail, when I start to see a denature in the lumbar, the lumbar spine positioning, the pelvic positioning, the exercise is done, the time is done, the reps are done, I shut it off. Um, I, I did a pre-con yesterday on, on some similar concepts, and people were asking me if it was for time, if it was for reps. And typically, any of my exercises are for reps. And the reason why is because they may look great on rep five, and rep six it goes, I shut them off. And so to me, it's about the integrity of this, this complex. Now, when we look at the trunk, and, and it says core training continuum, but that's more of a, uh, that was me to get people in the door. <laughs> but to me, it's the trunk. And to me, the trunk is, is the hips through the thorax, anything that has an attachment on the pelvis below, pelvis above, the thorax above and below. I love the last lecture talking about the interdigitation and the, the, complement, the complementary movements from the kinetic chain. And if you look at the lat exactly to his point, the lat attaches into the thoracolumbar fascia, attaches onto the scapula and up to the humerus. We have an, an actual muscle that connects the upper extremity to the lower extremity based on its attachment points. And so because of that very reason, we have to look at the trunk as a unit. It's not this thing, it's not this thing I do as filler exercises, it's not what I do to finish my workout, but it's complementary in how we sequence it within our workouts. I was talking yesterday about how I sequence my trunk work, my core work into my workouts, and it's in there with my priority objectives within my session. I may have a strength power exercise and then I filled in, that might be my A, and then my B is a stability in the trunk exercise, and then my C is active range of motion. And so I'm always building these things within, the, within my programming because it's a unit. It's an entire unit, and it's ultimately the important aspect of transferring a force and ultimately absorbing force. Um, and and we out, we, when we look at the trunk, we have to look at the, the, the potential ranges of motion I have with the trunk. I have flexion, I have extension. I have rotation, I have side bend. I have flexion and rotation. I have extension and rotation. I've got side bend and rotation. There's ultimately so many ranges of motion we can go through, and that's how I think a lot of practitioners build their exercises based on that. Well, I back engineer it and say, you know what, we have all these available ranges of motion. If I want to protect the spine, if I want to be resilient to force, I've got to be immovable in that region. One, I'm protecting the spinal column. Two, I'm transferring all my ground reactive forces and my gravity-based forces and any external forces as well, whether that's contact from another opposing. I work with a lot of athletes, but I also work with a lot of general pops. At the end of the day, our activities of daily living, or activities of daily life, are just like that of sports. They're just at higher, higher forces, and usually less collision. <laughs> but, but I'm gonna, chances of me showing you anything that you have not done before is probably impossible today. Probably impossible. Between YouTube fascination, between Twitter, Facebook, all our social media, we can see a million and one exercises. But to me, at the end of the day, it's about intent. The intent of what you're doing to set up the execution and your consistency and your message to your client. Now, with that being said, the functional word gets thrown out a lot in our industry. And to me, function, functional isn't about how I'm doing the exercise. It's not about the exercise. Oh, you know what? We're doing it functional. I'm going to go to one foot, and I'm going to hold my breath, and I'm going to hold something above my head. Now it's functional. Absolutely not. That's absolutely dysfunctional in my opinion. To me, functional is about what you are doing, how it's being done, 
not what it looks like on the outward appearance. You know, the more instability I add to an exercise, deem, people deem that to be more functional. And to me, I'm going to regress. I'm going to show you guys how we can actually go through regressive steps instead of progressive steps at times. So first and foremost, here's what we'll do. For those who want to partake in this, we'll have to spread ourselves out, move our coffees, everything like that. But we're going to start subtly. We're going to start settling. We're going to, this is going to be like a roller coaster. It's going to kind of build, 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 and then we're going to get some really cool dynamic things. But we have to set the foundation. If we do not set the foundation and we progress for the sake of progression, we are, are negligent as practitioners, and we're going to run into a situation where we're setting our, our clientele up for injury. So we need to be smart. So first and foremost, we're going to get into a quadruped position. Now I'm going to have one person come up here and, and be my dem Boom. Gotcha. I watched you yesterday, you're money. So the first thing we're gonna do, and I'm gonna have you guys watch, and I'm gonna explain it as we go, but you're gonna start into a quadruped position, all fours, and when I set up my quadruped position, I go six points of contact. I go dorsiflexion of the feet, I work on active mobility of the ankle joint, I, I go hands under elbow, under shoulder, and then knee under hip. Shoot back just a little bit. Now flatten your back a little more, there you go. Tuck your chin a little bit. And now first and foremost is I set up position. Setting up positions, go knees in a little bit closer to each other. There you go. So now what I do is I create the intent. Now to me, this is not a normal quadruped exercise, and I, I start all my warm-ups with this exercise, but I have him push into the ground. I want him to push into the ground as hard as he can, abdominals engaged, and from here he's going to abduct into fire hydrants. Uh, we'll just go three on each side, so in, into an abduction. There you go. He's going to abduct. Now, you notice what happens as he goes into abduction. He starts, to, he starts to recruit other ranges of motion to get that. Well, I want isolation. I want, I want activation through isolation. So what I'll tell the athlete is I want you to come up as high as you can without moving the position of the pelvis. Uh, let's post your tell the hips real quick. Right there. Now abduct. Right there. Once I start, and then come back in. Once I start to see that he's able to control range of motion, I may even pull him back even further on range of motion. Uh, don't come up quite as high. Do two more. But we start with our abduction. And what I'm doing with the athlete is I'm paying attention to how well, one, that they understand their, their postural awareness, how well they can stay engaged and be in good position. But then when they go into their range of motion, at what point within that range of motion does he start to leak or change position on one side versus the other? To me, this is my note taking. I am evaluating my athletes each and every day within their warm up just on this, on this series alone. Now from here, I'll transition it into hip circles. So from here, you'll either go, you'll just go uh, clockwise. Same idea, you're just gonna move the, the knee and the hip without moving the trunk too much. And we'll start to see different compensations. And the cool thing is you'll see different things jump out at you, scapular winging. You'll start to see how, how people will maybe drop into thoracolumbar lumbar extension. Good, on the other side. But ultimately, I'll walk around my athletes as they're going through the exercise, and I'm just looking for symmetry and where he's trying to get the range of motion from. Ultimately, as we start going through this today, you'll see a lot of people, actually, I'm not going to give it away because he's going to do it on the next one. I know he is. All right, the next exercise is a hip extension scorpion. The cool thing about these quadruped exercises, now we're attacking the trunk. We're attacking the entire trunk. When we're in the hip flex position, he's abducting. We're going TFL, anterior fibers of gluteus medius minimus complex. But now I'm actually going to go into the gluteus maximus complex. So now he's going to go into knee, a slight knee flexion up into extension. So again, abs brace, pushing the hands into the ground, draw the knee forward into flexion, then come up into extension. And we'll just get, let's go four reps on each side. And you'll see where he's starting to get his hip extension from. Right, he starts to lose it in the lumbar spine. Now who knows, right? it could be tight hip flexors. Oh, his glutes aren't activated. I, th I think that's a very, very, uh, th that's a term that we like to use a lot. But look at the left side glute, right? He's got a little bit better extension on the left side than he did the right side. Now I do try to tell the athletes, as they come up into extension, dorsiflex the foot, that gives you a little bit better activation through the hamstring and glutes. Good, so he has a little bit better extension. Now, a lot of times you'll see people do this. As they come up into extension, what are, they, what are you going to see in the femur? They tend to externally rotate, and I see every practitioner come up and say, you need to get that straight. Well, if you know how the fibers of the glutes arrange and where they, where they originate, where they attach, we actually externally rotate in extension in the, in the femur. So to see somebody come up into a scorpion and have some external rotation, that is not a faulty movement pattern. 
you're actually doing exactly what the tissue wants to do. We have no tissue in the body that just moves in the sagittal plane. There's always an element of rotation. So when you see that, it's not like a faulty plane. Oh, no, you know, we, we better stay to these corrective act exercises. Otherwise, you know, you're going to hurt yourself squatting. Not the case. You have to understand the underlying mechanism. So from here, after the uh, quadruped scorpion, he's going to take it into a lateral leg reach. Hands pushed into the ground, abdominals braced, legs straight back, dorsiflex foot. Now he's going to come out to the side in abduction. So as he abducts, I actually externally rotate the femur. Good. Squeeze the quad, externally rotate, and then come out to the side. Good. And when you do that, squeeze through the obliques big time with outside bending. Push the hands into the ground. And just by changing the intent of the exercise, I'm changing the activation patterning, no doubt. And people were asking yesterday, in these types of exercises, how many reps do we do? I say activation, not annihilation. Six reps. Good quality movement patterns. Hold great postural integrity. Then let's go to the next one. So essentially, I've just gone around the pelvic crest. Now from here, cool. Now I'm going to have you uh, flip over onto your back. Now, same idea, one knee bent, one leg straight, abs engaged, keep the trunk engaged, low back flat, dorsiflex the foot, squeeze the quad. Now he's going to squeeze, squeeze the quad as he lifts up into hip flexion. Good, he's getting a good hamstring stretch, but he's getting great activation on his flexor grouping. Good, and then back down. And again, at the same time, I'm walking around the athletes all the time looking and treating it as an evaluation. Now, if I see a discrepancy in, in left to right ranges of motion, I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to ask questions. What, what's your 0 to 10 soreness like today? Have you had a recent injury? If this is the first time I'm working with this person, go ahead. But then I'll also pay attention to the, the degree of dorsiflexion he's getting that might be changing his range of motion as well. But the entire time, he's going through a range of motion that ultimately, ultimately he can control and that he's getting from the isolated position that I want. He's keeping the trunk engaged, the hips stay relatively neutral as he comes up. A lot of people can come up higher than this, plantar flex the foot, bend the knee, and he can keep going. It's where we get, <laughs> something popped. <laughs> Whoops, that was free. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's where are we getting our range of motion from and what's our goal? To me, it's, it's activation through isolation. I just showed how he can get a lot more range of motion just by augmenting a couple of joints. I increase length tension response by dorsiflexing the foot. Now I'm going to get a true stretch. Instead of shortening the gastroc and soleus, I'm actually lengthening it as I go through my stretch. And that's what I want to see. So from here, you know, face that way. Again, I'm going to work around the entire pelvic crest. Yeah, face, face the audience going this way. Head, head to toe. So your head over here. And then your feet down here. Yep, on your side. So now we're going to go into an abduction. Arms fully straight. So now I, I always tell the athletes, engage the trunk, abs braced, dorsiflex the foot, squeeze the quads. He's going to lift up to my hand, slow and deliberate. Now, if he lifts up more than about 30 degrees of abduction, guess what he's going to get? He's going to get side, well, external rotation potentially uh, of the femur, but he's going to get side bend in the lumbar spine. And that's not what I want. I want him to stay engaged, hold position, and let's activate the heck out of the gluteus medius. Now, I said it a lot yesterday, and I'll say it a lot today. Joint position dictates muscle function. And depending on where his foot is, his femur is at, it's going to change his recruitment profile in the hip. If he externally rotates the femur, he's going to get this more in the glute max, more in the posterior division of the gluteus medius minimus. If he holds it neutral, he's going to stay more glute med. And if he internally rotates, he's going to get a lot more TFL and anterior fibers of glute med. So I tell my athletes, I want you neutral on this one. If anything, slightly deviate into a little bit of internal rotation, because most people, as they come up into abduction, will want to externally rotate. So that way, we can isolate the heck out of that. And that's hard when you're doing it slow and deliberate, right? Good, back down. And what I'll do a lot of times, to create the intent of what I want, I'll place pressure on the tibia, or on the fibula, just so they have an idea of how much effort they need to give me. And rest. Now, going back to the quadruped series. When, when I have my athletes, and they, they start to get really good at this, and they're like, oh, they start going through the motions because they hold position so well, then I start to challenge them. I'll say, okay, let's go contralateral for support, and from here, I want you to abduct and go through your movement patterns, holding position. Let's do that. Dorsiflex the feet. 
apps in the game? Yeah, this is going to be tough. <laughs> so this is, a lot of times our athletes tend to, or any of our clients tend to shut their brain off, and they quit thinking about their warm-up exercise. Oh, it's just a warm-up. But now what I do is I challenge them a little bit more. As they show me competency, then I take them into a contralateral support and have them go through the abduction um, exercise. And I'll take them through all these exercises with that contralateral support. The other thing I'll do as well is graded isometrics. As they start showing me, well, you're a big difference on both sides. Um, as they start to show me uh, great integrity and holding position, then I have them do graded isometrics, where maybe the first rep they come out and they hold it at 10% effort. Then they come down 20% effort, 30% effort, and they start giving me a greater degree of isometric at end range. So I have them hold it at end range and squeeze for a relative um, a perceived intensity. Let's go back to your sideline. So from the sideline, we did the abduction. From here, I'll go adduction. So I'll bend the knee. So we'll bend this knee. We're just clearing this leg out of the way. And from here, we're just going to extend. Joint position dictates muscle function. So what I want to make sure is that we're in a good extended position from ear all the way to ankle. And go ahead and bring it down. We'll do six reps. And he's, he's just he's adducting. He's pulling toward midline. And what I'm paying attention to is how drawn in is he? Our athletes, our clients who are really drawn in, sit a lot, play a lot of forward flex sports, it's going to be very tough for them to get into the extended position. They'll think they're in extended position, but I'll tell you what, the people who cannot get extension in this position will be your hip flexor strain people and your groin strain people um, chronically. Now, one, once he's nailed the adduction, I'll have him flip over to his stomach. Uh, do me a favor. Let's go your head over here. And we're going to go left hand, your left hand's going to be on your forehead, right hand straight out, uh, straight out like a T. Sorry about that. Now from here, we're going to go opposite side. I'm going to have you dorsiflex your foot, extend through the glute, and I'm going to have him lift the foot off of the ground about an inch, two inches, no more than that. And then from here, you're going to abduct, push out into my hand, slow and deliberate, foot down and back, back in. Same idea, 30 degrees of abduction, if that. But when I start to see the opposite side, ASIS, start to come off the ground, he's gone too far. He's trying to pick his range of motion up from somewhere else. Same idea here, lead with your heel. And the reason why I have him extending about an inch or two off the ground is why? If I ask him to extend through the hip any more than that, where's he going to get it from? Lumbar spine. He's going to start jamming up his facets. So let's go to the other side and switch hands. Again, I use these exercises as my screen. Oh, you see the difference there? Big difference there. If you saw that, it looked kind of subtly, but as he went into abduction, he got to about 15 degrees of abduction. That left side ASIS started to pop off the ground. And you see how he's changing the foot position as well. Yeah, yeah, it's a little more difficult. I'm, you, know, I'm, I'm, you know, look, we're, we all played sports. We all work out. We've all been injured. So it's not like, oh, I found something magical. No, it, it, it happens. <laughs> I think everybody wants to reinvent themselves as a practitioner. And look what I found. Your quality of life is so much better now. So now from here, after we go through the quadruped series, the straight-legged series, what I, what I deem my activation series, then I'll have you flip over to your back. And one knee, uh, both knees bent. And now we're going to go into hip extension series where the feet are dorsiflexed. And I actually, I, I actually want the feet neutral on this. Squeezing the ball, and I'm going to have you slowly come up into hip extension while squeezing the ball. Now, you're not trying to break the ball. You're just trying to add pressure into the ball. And begin. Slow and deliberate and squeeze. And what I typically do, uh, keep going, keep going. And the odd, <laughs> funny enough, what he was displaying in the quadruped series and extension, he's displaying here as well. He's not getting great extension. He'll get better extension as he goes through the reps. Abs engaged as you lift. So now I'm just, I'm just increasing the participation of who's helping me. Um, it, it, again, if we look at our adductors, we have three adductors that serve as hip flexors as well. We have our pectineus, our adductor longus, and our adductor brevis. So we've got a lot of tissues that can actually restrict us from getting extension. It's not just our hip flexors. We've got a, you know, it's not just the rectus and the sartorius and the iliopsoas. We've got a lot of other guys, too, who are maybe inhibiting this motion. So again, this is a way for me to activate the adductors as he's going through the reps. Now, same thing. Now I'll turn around and do the same idea. Now he's going to produce an abduction effort. He's not trying to beat me. We're just trying to, to it's a win-win. 
Now, I'm always looking at the feet as well because the feet are going to tell me where he's going to try to recruit from. I try to keep him more neutral, but uh, yeah. But what, what we'll tend to see a couple things. With the bicep femoris, if you see a lot of abduction of the foot, you're going to have a lot more bicep femoris activation. I try to keep them neutral because in my opinion, I think that if I keep them neutral, I'll get a more balanced activation approach of my bicep femoris and my tendinosus membranosus. Let's do a couple more. You didn't know what you were signing up for over here, did you? One more. There you go. Up, 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 extend, extend. This quality of extension is just okay in my opinion. And you can see one side's definitely different than the other. Um, we gotta work on that. <laughs> so, so now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take it into my, my, my pillar series and my pedestal series. Uh, these are the bread and butter. These set up everything I do when it comes to the trunk. So here's where I think everybody may want to join in and see how, how deliberately hard we can make some of these exercises. So again, these were just primarily activation exercises to kind of set up the, the, the chain of events. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go into a good old-fashioned plank. And the setup is everything. I, I said it yesterday, the devil is in the details. Tuck your chin. Good. Abs engage. Squeeze your quads. Squeeze your glutes. Push the ball of the foot into the ground. Uh, palms up. There you go. And elbows under the shoulders just a little more right there. Okay, so from here's my setup. Tuck your chin a little bit more. A little more. There you go. All right, this is my setup. And what I'm doing is once I put somebody in my setup, I try to keep my setup the same all the time. Now, one thing I always see in the planking and the, the, the push-up position holds that people do, I always say, oh, get full protraction, get full protraction. Ah, you know what? Most times I ask people to get full protraction, what are they going to do? They're going to go into thoracic spine flexion. Well, guess what? I can do a million and one other exercises to get protraction, retraction. Maybe I shouldn't do it here. I want to work on one thing and one thing only, and I'm paying attention to when does this guy start to give on me. Now, I'm cool with where he's at. A lot of people say, oh, drop your butt. No. If I asked him to drop his butt, what's he going to start doing? He's going to lose tension. He's going to start jamming up the facets. So I want to make sure that we're hold, holding a good suspended position here and rest. Good job. So we're going to go plank position. Once we, we're going to hold plank position for about 30 seconds. It's going to seem ridiculous, but, but play my game for me. Because once I get you guys in the plank position, I'm going to tell you guys what I want you to do to change your intent of activation. So for those who want to do this, spread yourselves out. Don't kick your neighbor unless you want to. OK, so I'm going to start the clock when everybody gets to the up position. Well, everybody that's participating. All right, so everybody have room? And here we go. Plank position, elbows under the shoulders, weights on the ball of the feet, squeeze. Now listen to me, everything I'm telling you I want you to do. Go ahead and get into the up position. Squeeze your quads, squeeze your glutes, drive the ball of the foot down into the ground as you drive your elbows hard into the ground, activating your lats. Now I, I, I saw somebody put like, there was like some new plank record that was set, like 13 days or something crazy. <laughs> I don't know. To me, if you're spending more time than 45 seconds on a plank, there's other things you can do with your time. Uh, that's in my opinion. But if you're squeezing, if you're engaging, a good, low back, in the orange shirt, low back up a little bit for me. Right there, low back higher. There you go, even higher. A little more, right there. Good, now tuck your chin. And rest. Okay, by pushing into the ground the way I was asking you to, could you feel different things activate or more muscular participation? At the end of the day, that's the goal of, I, I've never understood it, why in weight training or in anything else we tend to cheat a movement. To me, I want as much muscular participation to jump in and help me become more, uh, have more integrity. So the next exercise we're going to do, plank position. Now, I'm going to go to the side. So plank position, I'm holding my neutral position. From here, I'm going to slowly lift my hips vertical and then slowly, slowly, slowly come back down and stop. Slowly lift vertical and slowly come down and stop. If I'm thinking about a tempo, I'm thinking a three second up, three second down tempo on this exercise. Now, notice when I was going through my hip, hip raise, what was my torso doing? What was my weight doing? It was staying directly over my forearms. Most people, when they do this, here's what they'll do. And what happens is you lose all that tension on that, on that tissue. I want to maximize tension. So here's what we're going to do. Play my little game. Let's everybody get set up in your same position. 
Elbows on their shoulders, abs engaged. I'm going to call you up, one, two, three, and I'll call you down, three, two, one. Ready, one, two, three, three, two, one. Hold right there, keep holding. One, two, three, three, two, one. One, two, three, three, two, one. One, two, three, three, two, one. Time. Does that feel a little bit more difficult, right? Yes, sir. Well, I, want I want palms up because most people do two things. They'll, they'll put hands, they'll clasp hands together and they create a resultant of effort. Um, and I'll get to it in the side plank. We talked about it yesterday. A resultant of effort makes it easier. And also posturally. I find a lot of people, once they get into this position, they, they change hu uh, glenohumeral position. If I go here, it's easier to set them in a depressed, retracted position. Um, so what I teach this exercise a lot for my athletes who, who maybe come up out of their squat position and they, they, they don't have great awareness of where end range is. And so I teach that exercise, one, to teach them positional control. Where to get extension from, where end range is, how to have integrity in end range. Because you take an athlete, young or old, who maybe doesn't have that great integrity, and they're, they're going to come up and get extension through their spine, their RDL, their, their deadlift, and they're going to go into a hyperlordotic position. Again, we want to go in protected positions of that spinal column. All the flexing, bending, rotation, all the goofy things we do over our lifetime, it's just a matter of time before something tends to go on us. The more we arm the muscular system with integrity and awareness of end range, but also eccentric strength, the, more, the, the, longer we, the, the greater longevity we add to that person. Okay, so from here, we're going to go into our side plank. So crazy progressions here, I know. Side plank, same idea. Elbows under the shoulder, but remember, the, the devil's in the details. Elbows under the shoulders, the arm is in perpendicular position. We're going to go up into the hip extended position. First and foremost, posture is my priority. Hips forward, head back, this arm straight up. Abs engage. I always say squeeze the triceps, squeeze the trunk, squeeze your quads, and I will go down and, and hit everything, making sure that they're engaged. Now to pull that elbow underneath you just a little more. Now I, I tend to do these, if somebody's strong enough, I'll tend to do these elevated, uh, about a six, eight inch uh, block, because I think it's less stressful on the glenohumeral joint. It's not that I'm trying to make it harder. It's just less stress. Yeah, hip rotation, hip extension. So here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to go into our progressions from here. Remind me your first name. Joshua. Joshua. All right, Joshua, I'm going to have you lift up your left leg to me. Lift up your left leg about 20 degrees. Boom. That's pretty good. You, ah, there we go. Back down. And barely touching it right back up. So a couple things. When I start adding in my progression of leg raise, posture is, pro is, is my, my priority. And the second I start to see posture start to lose, he's done doing the leg raise and he's just going to go to the hold. Now, ba back to your point on the hands, same thing here. When he's holding right here, you tired? Tired yet? You good? Solid? You hold this another 20. We, we could break a record. Somebody start a watch. <laughs> so as he's holding this position, right now, his legs clasped together. What's happening? The adductors are actually activating, and they're helping each other. They're creating a resultant of effort, and they're actually helping him. The second he lifts this leg off, just a half inch, what's happened? The actor's like, sweet, we don't have to do anything, right? So now the gluteus medius, the QL, the obliques, are doing a lot of anti-side bending motion right now, but also the erector spinae gripping. Now, one thing I talk about a lot, and rest, dude, you gotta be getting smoked. Let's go to the other side. <laughs> the cool thing about these exercises, and, and uh, if you've heard me present before, I talk about forces and how forces um, resemble themselves or show themselves in our joint structures. We have compression, distraction, shear, and torque. I want to make sure that I make my athletes resilient to all those forces in all planes. If I do that, I keep them healthy. So go back to your position. We talked about yesterday with uh, um, doing uh, farmer walks and suitcase carries for those people that were there. But right now, he's holding position, and he's, he's controlling that side bend position. But more importantly, he's controlling distraction of the spine. Absolutely controlling distraction of the spine, con controlling compression of the spine just in a, a lateral plane here. Now go ahead and start lifting that leg. Squeeze the glutes, squeeze the quad. Boom. And this side, right, right away from his first rep, he started to lose extension. This was a side he didn't get great extension on in the quadruped series. So I always back engineer things and go back to what I saw earlier. 
Yeah, do you guys see that, how he's flexing the hip? Cool. Not cool, but cool. <laughs> cool for us, not for you. Good hand rest. <laughs> I'll, I'll put them up on like a, a six, eight inch box that makes their, their, their forces more vertical down on the glenohumeral joint instead of at that angle. Yeah. And, and guess what? Isn't that a dumb way to get impingement by doing side planks? <laughs> guess what? I've seen people do that. So now we're going to go into a, a reverse hip hike. So now we're going to go into our supine bridge, heels, uh, feet dorsiflex, heels into the ground, hip extend straight up. What do you think we're going to see here? We're, we'll see. I guess we'll see. <laughs> Ready? Because he's going to compensate feet, when I come. Right? Yep. They, they don't have to be that far apart. Now drive the heels on the ground. Start extending up. Abs engaged. You got it. Okay. Not bad. Back down. I didn't think we'd see that good of extension, but I'm sure he's getting more through his lumbar spine, actually. Keep going. Put the chest up. Oh. Touch your chin as you come up. There you go. And back down. So now what you're going to do, good, keep going, squeeze, 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 squeeze. Now this is a crazy exercise because you do this bilateral and you're like, I don't know what I'm working, I don't feel a thing. But, and rest. The second you go into this exercise, and I'll have him go into a leg raise with it, he's going to know exactly what he's working. But the same rules apply. If he can't maintain the extended position, the drill's done. Here's where we're going to see his deficiency in extension, no doubt. Ready? Sorry. You know what, I, I, I tell them place the hands however is comfortable. Some people, you know, turn to the phalanges, externally rotated, some keep them neutral, and everybody's so different. You want them underneath. Yeah, underneath, underneath the shoulder. shoulder, you got it. So hips extended first and foremost. Now start going, going to your left side leg raise. Boom. And you see the hip wanting to rotate and drop on the left side, and you keep it moving. Oh, man, good, let's do two more. And then we'll go to the other side. You can let that foot come all the way down to the ground. And you just see the quality of repetition starts to diminish. You see how that left side is significantly dropping. One, it could be a trunk integrity thing. Two, it could be a hamstring thing on the opposite side, a hamstring glute thing. Now we'll go the other leg. Hips up, hips up. Well, that's a monster, huh? <laughs> that is a tough exercise, and that's why it's so funny, you know, putting people in planking exercise. They're like, oh, that's, 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 I, I've done that. That's a beginner exercise. I'm like, really? It's how you do it. And it's what you're looking for. Uh, you know what, actually alternating legs is probably a better progression on the front end. Okay. Yeah, because the, the, uh, as we saw by rep three, he was smoked on one side. So it's a nice way to, to change off the, the stress, no doubt. Yeah, probably, I was mean. <laughs> cool, so here's what we're gonna do. Let's go into our side plank now. And once we get in a side plank position, for those people who are truly holding a, a posture aligned position, let's go into a leg raise. So spread yourselves out. Not everybody has to do this one. You, if you just want to watch the people around you and see maybe what they're struggling with or what they're doing very well with. So we're going to go slow and deliberate on my count again. Now every time we bring the leg down, we're going to barely touch the down leg, and then we're going to bring it right up. But I want everybody to start with the feet stacked. And I want you to feel what I was talking about, that, that, that resultant of effort. Hips extended, arm up, abdominals engaged. OK, so right now, who, who's, <laughs> by a show of hands, <laughs> Who's feeling it on their downside uh, gluteus medius? Probably not much right now, right? You're like, ah, I'm feeling stuff. All right, now start lifting the up leg. And you're going to feel the gluteus medius, the QL, the erector spinae grouping, the obliques. Everybody's trying to keep you from crashing down and in into lateral flexion. Head back. Remember, joint position dictates muscle function. Where our head goes, our hips tend to follow. Good. Yeah, the three, two, one kind of tempo. Sorry, everybody just holding up there. <laughs> Good. On the and rest, switch sides. You know what? Uh, here's one thing too. As a just as a you know, depending on who you're working with, if you have somebody that has maybe lateral meniscal type of issues, you felt yourself as you started to come up. How much stress there was right at the knee joint. Well, not every progression is for everyone. So make sure that you are really individualizing your program for your person. Uh, face the other side. 
And let's go a three, two, one up and a uh, one, two, three down, or however you want to count. Go ahead, one, two, three, hold. Three, two, one. One, two, three. Three, two, one. And start paying attention to the people who are starting to lose extension. Yep, just keep that tempo. You don't need to hear me count anymore. And I'm just looking to see when I, I love watching when people hit that break point, that threshold point. Yep, exactly. And time. All right, let's go into our reverse hip bridge. Ready, up into the extended position. Everybody's going to get to the extended position and be like, ah, okay, cool, great kinetic chain exercise. What are we working besides my wrists? Now, dorsiflex your feet. Now, let's go left leg. Let's go three lifts with the left leg. And we're going to go three lefts, lifts with the right. Driving the opposite foot down into the ground. That's our intent, driving that other foot down into the ground. Try to keep the feet dorsiflexed. That way we, we maximize that length tension in the, the posterior lower leg with the hamstrings. That's pretty tough, right? Trying to keep the hips neutral. Again, uh, micro progression, we're going through these progressions pr pretty quickly. Cool. Uh, which, uh, and when we, when we take off a base of support, we're going to have maybe that shift anyway. And that's the cool part about the exercise is that's where we have to regulate balance between the hips, between the trunk. So you, you may feel that with just taking that unloaded position. It would be like me going into a push-up position, taking one off. I'm going to feel it more in one leg versus the other. Cool? No, no, no. But again, remember what your consistency of your message is, is what are the hips doing? So now our next progression from a, in these push-up exercises, we're going to go into what I call an elbow tap. We're going to go opposite, opposite hand, opposite elbow. So push-up position, eight aside. Now pay attention to my hips on this. My feet are wide. I'm driving my, heat, my balls of the feet into the ground, and I'm pushing hard into this arm. I'm getting great shoulder and stability work at the same time. Slow and deliberate, trying to avoid any type of shift, any type of lumbar spine extension. And I'll actually tell my athletes, keep their hips up a little higher so we do not violate those positions. Slow and deliberate. I keep the hands narrow on early progression and take them wider as the athlete becomes stronger. And if you're pushing into the ground hard with the ball of the foot and the hand, you're feeling a lot of things working, right? Next progression off of this. That, that's pretty tough. The next progression is, a, is a, a coordinated exercise, no doubt. So you'll go narrow hand position, wide feet. From here, I'm going to go contralateral in my toe touch. Keeping my weight on the, ball of the, on the, the palm of the hand and the ball of the foot. Again, Trying not to lose position. Try to stay as solid as you can in the trunk. Here we go. Let's go five aside. Now, slow and deliberate. And to me, what really makes this exercise work, it's the, the trunk isn't about how strong the trunk is. It's about when. When can it fire? When can it stabilize? I, cause, <laughs> it's a different progression. No, uh, you know what, a little external rotation at the femur is, is the way I look at it. And also, if you touch the knee, you, you, the, you, you, to me, I, I like the actual, you know, them thinking of the hand and the foot leaving the ground at the same time and thinking of it that way. So going from, uh, prox or from, from distal to proximal. Yeah, if there's a restriction in, in external rotation as they come up, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. But I do try to keep it balanced, you know, because one side might not be the same as the other, but I try to keep it balanced and then let them open up the ranges uh, symmetrically together. Yes, exactly. And that's actually what we're going to get to in a sec. 
So where we can go into a plank position. Here, actually, yeah, uh, let's go diagonal with me. So you're facing me, though. <laughs> and, and some distance away, because you're going to hold one end, I'm going to hold one end. And we're going to play a game of trust here. So <laughs> hold on to this. So we're going to go into a plank position. And Joshua and I, we're just going to do a little tug of war. Uh, actually, it's kind of a win-win tug of war. I'm going to pull toward me. Now you're going to pull toward you. Oh, so, so yep. So now you pull. Now, I can't watch Joshua right now, but what I'm hoping is that he pulls. I, I don't want to see this. I want him to pull in and stop at the plane of the back. There you go. And then. Now, holding position on this exercise, wow. Yeah, you can see all, all the offsetting positions here. Now, again, the goal is to hold neutral. Now, ironically enough, the person who's doing this exercise thinks they are holding neutral. That's the funny thing about this. So I need one other person for our next progression uh, to come up here. Joshua, do me a favor. I want you to go into a kneeling position right here. I want you to hold this band. And then, um, what's your name? Dan. Dan, uh, uh, but you're going to face just like this. Face me, everybody, with your right knee up. Yep, and you're going to hold with your arms straight out. Dan, you're going to hold it right down here, but hold it with both hands. <coughs> here, I'll show you. <laughs> I'll show you. But you're going to jump in right after me. So here's all Joshua's going to do. He's going to hold the band. He's going to hold a neutral position. Again, alignment from ear, shoulder, hip. And he's just going to hold in this position. Now, I've got the arms fully extended because I've got maximal amount of torque around the spine at that position. I've got pretty good resistance right here from Dan. And I'm just going to have Joshua hold this position. <coughs> so outside, uh, right knee up. Now dorsiflex the feet and get the hands right out to the sternum, chest up. Now one, one thing you'll see, and this is pretty tough, you're going to start to see people, yeah, foot flat, push the foot into the ground, chest up. And you'll start to see a body sway. And you'll start to see them compensate a little bit. But once they show me good in, uh, integrity here, I'll have Dan now bring it up to neutral. So once he shows me great integrity here, then I start playing around with it. A little rhythmic stability. I'm not giving him a lot of resistance. I'm just forcing him to react. That's tough, huh? And I'm not, I'm not throttling him. I'm just adding some light perturbation so he can activate and rest. You, got, you want to try it, Dan? <coughs> I'm just trying to give him a light perturbation so he has to respond and react. Good, arms straight out. Good, holding position. Good, a little more, uh, a little higher, Joshua, there you go. Good, shoulders down and back. Yeah, Dorsey flex back foot. Pushing that front foot into the ground, good, and rest. So there's a ton of variations we can do off this. So why don't you provide resistance for me? So we can do a variation where, yeah, just straight across, where I just push and pull Changing, yeah, exactly, power presses. Where I can change position here, but at the same time, I love the perturbations more than anything on this exercise. I've got maximal tension here at 90 degrees, and then they're, they're adding either a perturbation to either the band and or to my hands, and I've got to redirect and, and hold position. Cool. Yeah, I always tell people to keep the shoulders depressed and slightly retracted in this exercise as well, because that will help keep them more cerv cervically neutral. All right, next exercise. So uh, I'm not a big unstable surface guy, but I will use it in, in some scenarios. The first exercise we'll do, and actually, Dan, I'll have you grab that ball. So we've done traditional planks on balls. Well, what I'm going to do, instead of a, a traditional rollout where people roll as far as they can, I want to keep them in a pocket of tension when they roll out. So the forearms are going to be parallel, feet are slightly wider, and you're going to roll out about two to three inches and then drive back in driving the elbows into the ball, slow and deliberate. Thinking, as you pull in with the elbows, think about really activating the lat. Elbows start under the shoulders. If people start with the elbows under, uh, past the shoulders, you have no tension. You have no tension, so I want the elbows directly under the shoulders, slower, slower, slower. Slower on the way out, tuck your chin, boom. This is a big, strong dude, and we've got some good shaking going on, four reps in. Hips down, <laughs> hips down, head back. Yeah, chin tuck. 
Let's go two more. Awesome. And again, it's not how far we go, it's the pocket that we can control it in. This exercise becomes a lot more difficult when you actually shorten the range of motion. Maintain tension on that midsection. The next exercise, you know, people have probably done this one as well, is stir the pot. But I always see stir the pot done like this. To me, I want to prop up 90 degrees at the elbow, and from here, small circle out, holding position, driving the forearms into the ball. You have to think about driving the forearms into the ball on that. Let's go three of one direction, three the other direction. Different progression. Get up to that. You, um, safely. Why? Why would you do that? <laughs> yep. So normally I'll, I'll do this as well in a in a full push-up position. I'll show that in two seconds, hopefully safely. <laughs> Once you guys get three on both sides, I'll show the next one. <coughs> so the exercise was uh, f feet on a bench. Uh, hands on a medicine ball or on a physio ball in a push-up position. So what I'll typically have them do is grab into the ball first and foremost. They've got to pinch into it. A lot of people just set their hands on the ball. You have to pinch in. The cool thing about pinching in, now you get great anterior delt, pecs activated, uh, biceps activated. But once I, I have stability here, then I just put the feet up onto the chair. <laughs> the chair, yeah, so frictionless surface. And same idea, it's not how far I roll out, it's what's happening in the lumbar spine as I do, and how much tension can I maintain as I roll. Now, if I roll back too far, I lose tension. I want to stay in that pocket where I've got maximal, maximal tension on the trunk. And you can feel, the second you start to roll out, you'll start to feel that lumbar, my time is up. <laughs> Everybody's like whistling at me, hey! Um, but as you start to roll out, you'll, you'll feel that lumbar spine start to shear. And you've got to, that, those are the forces we want to overcome and control. Yes, sir. I think it's the standard of like how you use like, like reps and how many seconds the next holding is actually. 30, 45 seconds. Yeah, once I, if, if there's no, no global shaking, they're not losing position, I progress to the next exercise. Okay. Yep.